today about uh, OCT. And uh, I know that this is an uh, advanced uh, modern light microscopy course. Uh, and OCT in some sense has been used for microscopy applications. It's also one of these uh, technologies that uh, kind of span different scales. And, and so it's often used for you know, mesoscale type imaging as well. Uh, so, I, I want to provide an overview, just some uh, the basic fundamentals. Some of this may reinforce the material that you were um, looking at already in the course, and, uh, and then also talk about some applications. Uh, to give you a, a bit of background, uh, I'm a professor here in electrical and bioengineering, and my lab is up at the Beckman Institute, and I've been here about 16 years. Uh, much of my work in, involves development of optical imaging technologies and then translating those into to medical and biological applications. So um, I'm not presenting a lot of the, that sort of tech transfer aspect or commercialization aspect, but if people have any questions about anything, feel free to ask me and, and we can have a discussion that way too. Um, so I always like to start with this uh, quote, the front line of research is almost always in a fog, and it is these instruments that function as our eyes to allow us to gather the map points in the fog and construct a picture of the world in the form of a map or an image, um, and ultimately to penetrate those obscuring mists. So being able to image deep into highly scattering tissue uh, is one of the main goals that OCT uh, is all about, and being able to image deeper than, say, confocal or other technologies. Um, Biomedical imaging in general is a really big field, and, and optics uh, has the, the, the benefit of being able to really probe at the cellular and molecular level. And, uh, and so you've been learning a lot about microscopes and, and various types of uh, image formation techniques, physical processes, um, and OCT that I'll talk about is, is really based more on scattering uh, of light and the collection of that backscattered light, whereas a lot of other techniques are utilized fluorophores or nonlinear processes. Uh, to generate that. And even optical techniques can be used in a sort of diffuse optical tomography way of being able to, to measure light coming deep from within um, specimens as well. So much of what we're interested in is this, these size scales. And if we look at imaging across these size scales, it's really this, this, this back end here, the uh, molecular, the cellular imaging that optics is very good at. And, um, and really the goal for a lot of this uh, or at least biomedical imaging, is to detect, diagnose disease at early stages. And to do that, we have to really look at this molecular cellular level uh, where those changes begin. So that too is why uh, uh, optical imaging, I think, is favorable for these scenarios. It's not without its limitations. Uh, but if we think about OCT and optical imaging, it, it falls, as I was saying, in this, this mid-scale range. So down here at very high resolution, you know, we can see individual cells, subcellular organelles, um, uh, even uh, individual molecules, and, uh, and however, the, the penetration depth or the imaging depth is, is quite limited. Um, we can also think of this on par with histology, more from the clinical realm, whereas tissue sections taken out, stained, looked at under uh, micro, you know, white light microscopy most commonly, or fluorescence microscopy, and, um, and to be able to diagnose disease at that scale. On the other end of the scale is more of the medical, clinical imaging modalities where the resolution is, is worse, uh, but our depth of imaging is much greater. And so we have things like the standard x-ray, MRI, um, this is intravascular ultrasound, <coughs> or standard fetal ultrasound. And, um, and so these, again, are on that size, of this, that size scale. OCT kind of falls in the middle here with resolutions ranging from 10, around 10 microns, sometimes less. Uh, but being able then to image over uh, millimeters uh, field of view, or sometimes even larger than that, and being able to image uh, millimeters deep into scattering tissue as well. So it, it, uh, it sort of bridges these size scales. If we look at a comparison of OCT, um, and this is multi-photon microscopy, nonlinear techniques, um, you, know, you can see this, it's hard to make comparisons because there's so many different uh, parameters. But generally, our resolutions are better than these other modalities. Uh, our field of view, our depth is a few millimeters. It's very low cost relative to some of these clinical modalities. And it's fast. <coughs> and, uh, and the ability to use it in probes, by that I mean handheld probes or catheters or needles or other things are, are quite good. 
um, for, uh, for OCT. So that's kind of where it falls in perspective. Could you cover absorption of biological tissue? Uh, so this is a really important graph that kind of sets the stage for all of biomedical optics. Uh, and it really is looking at the absorption coefficient versus wavelength. And, um, and what are the primary absorbers in tissue? Because we have to know what these are uh, for many reasons. First off, if we're trying to image deep into tissue, we want to uh, not really be at a wavelength that's strongly absorbing by that tissue. Uh, and also, if we want to uh, treat tissue in some way, like with optics, we want to know what, where those absorption peaks lie so we can target those for, say, thermal or photochemical absorption. Um, but there is uh, kind of this region here in the middle in the near infrared wavelengths that are considered the biological window in tissue. And it's roughly around 750 to about 1350, where across those wavelengths, our absorption is very low. It's at a minimum. Uh, and so therefore, attenuation of light through tissue is uh, governed largely by scattering, not so much by absorption. And so those are the wavelengths we tend to think about and prefer for OCT and for others that we want to get light through tissue. Um, and obviously avoid these visible wavelengths or these further uh, IR wavelengths that have strong absorption. So what I want to talk about is today we can break this down into five different sections. Just a little bit of the background and theory of OCT. Uh, talk about engineering these view delivery <coughs> instruments because if, we're, if we have a fairly limited depth of uh, imaging and so we have to get the light to the tissue that we want to image and we can engineer different ways of doing that. I want to give some examples of that morphological cellular imaging, spectroscopic OCT, and then applications to cancer and, and primary care. So just to begin with, with OCT, uh, this is a rough incomplete history of where this came from. And it started in the 1980s with telecom, that big boom. And uh, in telecom, they were using fiber optic measurements. They would string you know, fibers, fiber optics across the oceans. And, uh, and inevitably, there's faults, there's breaks somewhere. And they developed optical time domain reflectometry or optical frequency domain reflectometry as a way of finding out where those, those, those fiber faults or fractures are. And the es essential idea here is that you just send down a pulse and you look for, and you wait for reflections to come back. And, and if there's a, a break in that fiber, it's going to set up a point where there's a reflection. And that'll come back and you can either through uh, frequency analysis or time analysis measure where that fault was that re reflection came from. And then send your ship out and go and repair that fiber at that point. Well, the, some, the same idea uh, was then in, in 1990 considered for optical ranging in tissue. Could we send light in and, and use these, these time, these, these ranging capabilities to detect where those reflections came from within tissue? And, and so in 1991 was the first, uh, we consider the first publication, major publication in science for OCT that demonstrated this optical ranging in biological tissue. And while this was done a lot uh, in, say, 90s for single, single point depth scans, OCT essentially said, well, why don't we repeat that measurement across the tissue and form an image based on those reflections? And so that's where we get OCT. Tomography is a bit of a misnomer. By definition, tomography refers to being able to see inside something or visualize inside. But uh, for us in, I think, the science and engineering communities, tomography often refers to an algorithmic approach to reconstruct images. Uh, like in X-ray CT or other uh, tomographic approaches. In, in OCT, we do some uh, image reconstruction, but it's not really a tomographic inverse radon transform approach uh, to reconstruct those images. Uh, and so OCT's first application was in the eye because the eye is naturally transparent. You can send light in. Uh, they had no good way of uh, prior to OCT to resolve the retina in different retinal layers. Um, they used ultrasound. And of course, the resolution wasn't there, and you had to put gel on the eye, put a probe on the eye, and, and nobody wanted to do that. So, uh, but OCT has really taken off for ophthalmology. And today, if any of you, I would bet maybe some of you have even had an OCT exam of your eye, um, any problems with your eye, you'll get an OCT scan. And it's really the gold standard now for looking at the retina. Uh, there was also a lot of uh, technology ex exploration. So, using longer wavelengths uh, to look at to highly scattering tissue, uh, such as skin or muscle or other tissue other than the eye. Uh, a lot of development of Doppler, high speed, high resolution, a lot of different applications were explored. 
Uh, and then we started doing OCT in, in endoscopes in patients, uh, cellular imaging, high resolution, uh, artery coronary artery imaging in humans, uh, molecular and contrast agent techniques, and then beginning to use GPUs and computational approaches. And, and now we're at really at this point where there's lots of commercial uh, commercialization going on, and it's uh, the technology is kind of stabilized, uh, but we're really exploring doing large clinical studies to show to the medical community, other than ophthalmology, that you know CT has value in cardiology and GI and other applications. That's kind of where we're at now. OCT, like I said, uh, is based on optical ranging. So uh, just like ultrasound, to reconstruct those images, but instead we put in uh, pulses of light, uh, or CW broadband light, and we look at reflections that come back. And, and in ultrasound, we can use detectors because the speed of sound is slow enough. But in, with light, we have to use interferometry to be able to measure where those, those reflections came from. So that brings up uh, coherence theory. Uh, did you cover? Some of these principles in class. Is this look familiar? Yeah. As a free As a free yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I only have a slide or two on this, but basically, if you think of the temporal coherence function or this autocorrelation function uh, of you know this this stationary complex random function uh, correlated with itself, uh, that results in this g of tau, and um, this intensity, of course, uh, can be represented there. We can normalize uh, against G naught, or G of zero. And, uh, and this is considered this complex degree of temporal coherence. It's, it's a value, it's little g of tau between zero and one. And it relates to just how coherent is that light source uh, over time or over space. So one way to represent this is a coherence length. And coherence, refer to, coherence is a complex uh, idea and, and fundamental by itself. But Complex, you can think of coherence as, is there a phase relationship, a known phase relationship between these fields at one point in time versus another? And, and obviously, um, over, over great distances or over great time, um, these, these fields are going to lose coherence with one another. Um, this coherence length, and as the coherence time kind of defines that, that in space and time. So for instance, this laser, uh, coming out of this laser pointer, uh, has a very long coherence length. So, you know, the field at coming right out of here in the field far away, uh, there is still coherent. There's still a known phase relationship between those two. If this was a low coherence light source, like maybe uh, an LED, that uh, the light from the, the LED versus on the wall are no longer coherent. Right? So there is no longer this phase relationship. This is also very... Uh, importantly related to the spectral width. So, and this is related by this uh, power spectral density function uh, or this wiener kitchen theorem that says the, the spectrum, S of nu, is going to be uh, related to this autocorrelation function, G of tau. And, um, and in fact, there's a Fourier transform relationship between these two. So what that means, I think it's here, yeah, what that means is um, this, in this Fourier transform relationship, if we have an autocorrelation function, right, that's very narrow in time, then it's going to correspondingly have a very broad spectral density function, right, a broad spectrum. Uh, similarly, if we have a narrow spectrum, right, then that autocorrelation function is going to be broad. Okay. So think about that in terms of these sources. If if we have this laser coming out of this pointer, this laser uh, has a very narrow spectral density function, right? It's essentially one or just a few wavelengths in this light, okay? But that means that it's going to have a very long autocorrelation function in time. So it's going to have a long coherence time, okay, or a long coherence length, all right? So that's an inverse relationship. So you should be able to tell the coherence of the light just by looking at the spectrum, okay? And if you see a spectrum that's very broad like that, um, then it's going to have a very short autocorrelation function. That means there's a, a phase relationship between uh, only o between the two uh, waves only over a short distance in time. <coughs> okay, this is this is the essence of kind of what, how OCT operates. So if we think about now this optical ranging in OCT or low coherence interferometry is what we what we base OCT on. If we come back to these reflections. 
And now we use an interferometer to detect these reflections. Uh, we have a source. We have a beam splitter that splits that beam into a reference arm and a sample arm. And reflections, in the reference arm, let's say it's a meter. And we're going to get reflections back from all the different tissue layers in the sample. When reflections from each of these recombine at the detector, uh, we're going to get interference at the detector if the optical path links between those two arms are going to be matched within the coherence link of the source. So that's what's key. So if we have a source that's a laser like this, then we have a long coherence link, and we're going to see these interference fringes regardless of what position we put this mirror in, because it's just a long, the coherence link may be you know, tens or a hundred times longer than that, this path line here or here. So that means no matter where we put that mirror, we're getting interference, and it's usually uh, a uniform amplitude. Now, if the source were a low coherence link source, like an LED or a superluminescent diode, that means that there's only going to be a short distance at which there is a coherent relationship between the photons in the reference arm and the sample arm. So we're only going to see signal when these path links are matched within that coherence link. Okay, so for instance, if this sample were to tissue but a mirror as well, then we'll have a reflection here and a reflection here. And as we move this, we change the distance, we're going to map out, uh, we're going to see these fringes only over a distance of that coherence link. Okay, and so the envelope of this is, is essentially that, that spectral density function. Of that source, okay. is that kind of clear? This is this is really the essence of how OCT works. So now, um, before I talk about that, so think about essentially as I move this reference mirror back and forth, I'm changing this path, line, and I'm essentially changing the position in the sample where I'm going to measure a signal. Okay. So if I move this, if I make this longer, I'm going to sample. I'm only going to see signal from deeper in that tissue. Okay, and it's. Using this as kind of a window at which you can measure that, that signal. Okay, so if we have these two coherent waves, um, cross correlation function, we normalize that, we get this interference of the equation, which is key to this. And so what this equation states is that there's DC components, there's intensity values for both of those waves. Um, there's, here's that, that uh, normalized autocorrelation function, and then there's a phase relationship between those two. And so as we vary, um, the, the distance in one of those arms, those reference arms, we're changing that time delay. And, uh, and so this envelope is really two times that normalized autocorrelation function. And, and so think about that. If the coherence length is long, that's going to be long. If it's coherent length is short, it's going to be short. So for OCT, what do you think you want that in, in terms of these parameters? Long coherence length. Long? Why? Uh, you can image deeper tissue. Okay. Well, if it's long, um, so the imaging deep is going to be governed more by the absorption scattering properties of the tissue. This is really telling us kind of our window of where we're going to measure from. And if, it, if it's long, then we really have no discrimination about where the signal uh, every signal we get back is going to have um, basically the same value. Uh, whereas here, we're actually going to be able to discriminate and only measure from a, a specific point in space. Okay, so we really want the short coherence length because this width corresponds to the axial resolution of the system. So the coherence length is the axial resolution. I think I have a, maybe a layout right here. So, so think about now as we're focusing this light. So we have either a low or high NA uh, objective or optics. And you know, here's our focus, here's our confocal parameter, which is twice the Rayleigh range. And, uh, and this falls off, the Rayleigh range is defined at the point where this is two, you know, root two times the radius of, of that beam. And, and so that window, that coherence length, it acts as a little coherence gate window and as we move that reference mirror we're essentially moving the position of this window through this volume and, and maybe here you can see where that coherence link determines the axial resolution the transverse resolution is really governed by the beam diameter 
at different positions in depth. So if we have a, generally most of OCT uses low MA objectives uh, because you want to have a fairly uniform transverse resolution over your imaging depth. The other thing that's important to note here is there's a complete separation between transverse resolution and axial resolution. Axial resolution depends on the bandwidth of that source, whereas transverse resolution depends on your numerical aperture of your objective. So if we go to a higher NA system, um, and this is what's called optical coherence microscopy, then we have a real narrow depth of field. And if our coherence gate is about the same size as that, then we have to make sure that these align with, with one another. So we get we get signal back, you know, around the focus, but it's also within the coherence gate of our OCT system to detect those those photons. So there's some challenges with that. For the most part, uh, low NA systems are for cross-sectional imaging in depth, and uh, high NA systems are for on-fos imaging, like a like in a standard microscope. Okay, because you wanna you don't have a large depth of field to look in depth. So to do OCT then, we will acquire these single depth scans, or A, A scans, and the envelope of that looks like this. So we see attenuation in tissue because of scattering and absorption. Uh, what's not shown here is that carrier frequency underneath, which is from that interference. Uh, and that represents a single column of data, uh, whereas the intensity here represents the degree of optical scattering coming back from the tissue. Then if we simply step our beam over and we repeat that, we can assemble our two or our three-dimensional image based on an, you know, label-free endogenous optical scattering properties of the tissue. Uh, with OCT, we do this cross-sectional, and with OCM, we do that on FOSS uh, type image. And that's how we collect this, this dimensional data. Well, these are some examples of uh, how, when we change the parameters in OCT, how does that affect uh, our imaging? So, OCT at different wavelengths, uh, if we use 800 versus 1060 versus 1300, uh, you can hopefully appreciate that the longer wavelengths, we can see some of these deeper structures in the skin. Um, and this is largely because at longer wavelengths, there's less scattering. Uh, we're still within this biological window, but longer wavelengths have lower scattering. So it allows us then to image deeper. And then these are on FOSS images taken from these, and you can see the different structures. So depending on the wavelength, we can see and highlight different structures because each wavelength is going to scatter differently uh, within the tissue. So that's one parameter we can tweak. Um, another is that bandwidth. And so one of the things that we have to worry about is as we change different wavelengths, uh, we still want to maintain that high axial resolution. Uh, but if we go to longer wavelengths, we have to have proportionally wider bandwidths to support that. So this is one case where uh, titanium sapphire uh, light around 800 nanometers has about 160 nanometer bandwidth. So that's our spectrum. Here's our autocorrelation function, about the two micron, uh, full width half max. And this is uh, imaging there, I think, in skin. <coughs> if we go to longer at 1050, um, you know, here we have a, about the same uh, bandwidth as we did at 800, but you can see that the autocorrelation function is going to be wider. Uh, and then th these are some super continuum sources that have huge bandwidths. Uh, and then, even though they're centered around 1300, they have a very short uh, autocorrelation or, or axial resolution um, at those. So a lot of engineering has to go into the source to try to maintain uh, the right optical parameters for OCT. Okay, um, so what I talked about first was what's called time domain of OCT, and that was the first mode for how OCT was built, and, um, or how these scanning systems and it's called time domain because essentially we're in time, we're changing that reference arm pattern. Okay, and we're collect, building up an image that way. Well, we know that in the space, as you probably have heard from the class too, there's time frequency duals everywhere. So in time domain, this is just iterating what, what I showed, we had a broadband source, we had our sample, we had a moving reference arm, okay, and we had our detector. We can actually do the same type of, um, well, let me back up. So a single depth scan showed that carrier frequency, and we looked at the envelope, and the envelope gives us the amplitude versus depth okay, for a single column. All right, well, then we can go about this a different way, and we can look at spectral domain OCT. 
Now, look at what's different here. We still have a broadband source, we still have our sample, but what we've done is we no longer have a moving reference mirror. We keep that stationary. And we change our detector, our photo detector, to a spectrometer, okay, that's now looking at the entire spectrum. And what essentially we're doing with this is we're collecting signal from all depths at once. So instead of scanning this mirror to collect depth at each point, we are sending light in and we are using the fact that um, when we get interference from our sample and our reference, then the depth is going to be encoded in the frequency of those fringes. So these interference fringes here are going to have different frequencies. And when we do Fourier analysis on those, uh, we can separate those out uh, in, in frequency, which corresponds to depth. So what's nice about this is um, uh, there's no moving parts, right? So we don't have to worry about moving the reference mirror. It ends up being much more phase stable, very stable system. Uh, it also can be faster because these line scan cameras can acquire at hundreds of thousands of, of uh, A scans per second. Whereas with a moving mirror, because of inertia and mass, you're lucky to get to about a thousand hertz uh, with that system. So we can go faster. Uh, then uh, there's also what's called swept source OCT. And here, uh, we've gone back, we've replaced that spectrometer back with the detector. But what's different is now we use a narrow band swept source instead of a broadband source. So instead of showing, illuminating the sample with all these wavelengths at once, a broadband source, we have a, a, a laser basically that is swept um, in wavelength over that broadband. So effectively, we're still covering the same broad bandwidth, but now we're doing it at a wavelength at a time. The advantages of this is that this can be even faster uh, than spectral domain. So there are sources out there that now can sweep at megahertz rates, and we can, um, we can collect those A-scan rates at megahertz. Um, there's, of course, some disadvantages because those are moving parts in some of these, these, uh, these other swept lasers and, that results in some instabilities, but, uh, but if we really want speed, uh, we go with the swept source. Now, for either of these kind of four, that are called Fourier domain uh, ways, then the data that we collect on whether it be on our spectrometer or uh, as we sweep that source, we now get a spectral data that looks like this, and we have to uh, enter a Fourier transform that, <coughs> and then just look at the uh, one side of this to get back our signal in depth. So we can arrive at the same information just a different way using these, these four domain approaches. So those, those uh, have been the technological innovations over time. Um, so if you think about, uh, you, you said you were learning about confocal. And, and confocal, have you seen that diagram? It's kind of a traditional diagram. So in confocal, you can do optical section. And the optical section is because you have a point source, whether it be a laser or some other light source, um, and that point source is focused to a focal plane in the tissue. Uh, and then you have a detector, you have a pinhole here that's in front of your detector, and that pinhole is placed confocally uh, with the point source. So what that means, if you follow the white line, then fluorescence at that focal plane, or reflected light, is going to pass uh, and be able to pass through that pinhole and get detected. But if there's any light or fluorescence above or below that focal plane, it's going to get blocked by that pinhole. So, so this is a way of spatially rejecting that out of plane light. And that's what confocal does. That's what allows you to, to section uh, in, in depth. Uh, although you can only go probably about 50 microns or 100 microns at best into scattering tissue. Now how does that compare to OCT? Well, with OCT, our pinhole is really the fact that we use optical fibers, single-mode fibers that are 9 micron cores, uh, and to be able to get light into that, that effectively acts as a pinhole. So we get spatial rejection that way. But in addition, we get coherent rejection, because uh, let's say light gets focused into the, the sample, and, uh, and some light is going to come straight back, right? But some light is going to bounce around, and then happen to get recoupled back into the, into the system. So those, the light that gets bounced around uh, still may get collected, but it, it has changed its phase. There's no longer that phase relationship between that multiply scattered light 
and the light coming back from that reference mirror. Okay, so if there's if you've lost that phase relationship, it's no longer coherent and it's no longer going to be detected. So OCT rejects that multiple scattered light because it's no longer coherent you know, with that light in the reference arm. And we get both spatial and coherent rejection. So that's why OCT can go millimeters deep into scattered tissue, whereas confocal can only go um, you know, tens or hundreds of microns. So that's the advantage there. So I talked about the bandwidth uh, and the, the resolution. So the axial resolution in OCT is inversely proportional so that means, again, if we want a shorter coherence length, higher axial resolution, we need broader bandwidth, so a larger delta lambda. And if we plot that out, we can see that if we want to get down to two micron axial resolution, we have to really start getting pretty unique optical sources that have huge bandwidths, and that's hard to generate uh, for, for microscopy. Uh, so this is something we always kind of have to pay attention to. And if we use, again, longer wavelength light, that um, that increases or makes our resolution worse as well. So there's trade-offs here that we have to always make. Um, these are some comparisons. So a titanium sapphire mode lock laser, um, and this brings up another point. So OCT can be used with CW beams, right? Like this is a CW narrow line with laser. Right? A superluminescent diode is a CW source, but it has a broad bandwidth. And the way that they generate those, I don't know, does anybody know how they make that? An SLV, if you're taking any optoelectronics. Um, they, they start with a laser diode, and they essentially try to prevent it from lasing. So <coughs> this, a laser diode lases, you get this, this narrowing of the spectrum, and only one wavelength is really lasing in that cavity. Um, if you take a, a, that, that gain medium and you angle cleave the facets on either end, you're not going to get the strong reflection that comes back and forth to, to reduce lasing. But instead, you're going to get just this superluminescence and this broadening of the spectrum. And so that's how SLPs are made. Um, so so that's, that's a CW source that's broadband. This is a CW source that's narrow line length. If we have a mode lock laser, then we have a very short pulse. It's not CW, it's pulse, with pulses on the order of 100 femtoseconds. So what do you, oh, the answer is given here, but what do you think a, a short optical pulse spectrum looks like? Broad, right? It's this time frequency, there's also this time frequency relationship. So a short pulse in time means it's got a broad bandwidth, so there's a broad spectrum. And, um, and so that's, how, that's another way we can get broad spectrum light for OCT, is using short pulses. So that comes from a Thai sapphire. This is a very unique source to give 260 nanometer bandwidth. And that's compared to a superluminescent diode at 32 nanometer bandwidth. And if we, again, look at those autocorrelation functions, that SLD uh, shown here has about 11 micron axial resolution. That titanium sapphire has about a 1.5 micron axial resolution. So higher resolution with that. So a lot of effort has gone in to try to make these sources as broad as possible. And, and you can generate broad spectrum light through supercontinuum generation. So these are photonic crystal fibers that have a real small core that's five micron or 10 microns in size, and it's surrounded by this honeycomb structure of air. <clears throat> if you pump this with a, with a laser, which is kind of shown in this dotted line here, then through nonlinear mechanisms, you get spectral broadening. And the spectrum that comes out is super broad. So this is 1,200 nanometers of bandwidth. And it's really because of the spatial confinement and the nonlinear process to generate that. Now, and so because of it, we can generate a light source that looks like a rainbow. It's just filled with all of these wavelengths. The problem of this, though, is that these the spectrum that's shown uh, is not necessarily all fully coherent. So if you look at the shot to shot, uh, variability of what the spectrum looks like. It's spiky all over the place. So that spectrum is an average of millions of pulses, and they kind of average out to look at that spectrum. So this presents a problem. People have used supercontinuum uh, for OCT, uh, and um, it's been a challenge. A lot of my the work in my group has been sort of trying to figure out to make sure that this spectrum is widely coherent and can be used uh, for this. So, uh, with this type of fiber, we can, we can actually select different wavelengths. Um, 
this is all neural wavelength light. Uh, so there's a lot of tricks we can play to manipulate the light in different ways. Um, so if we want to implement an OCT system then, uh, generally we, we resort to fiber optics uh, as our beam splitters. And, and here, this happens to be two couplers, two beam splitters. We have a titanium sapphire laser. We have two detectors which act as to kind of dual balance to elimin eliminate any kind of noise, laser noise that's common on both of those. And then this is, uh, can be a spectral domain detection with a spectrometer or a time domain with a photodiode. And then our reference arm can be stationary or can move. And then the sample arm, we generally will have, we'll scan the beam with galvos or some other way to scan it across the tissue. And this is uh, kind of an older source, but you can kind of get a sense of the, the parameters, the resolution, the power. We're just using a few milliwatts. Um, 29 kilohertz acquisition rate here. Uh, this is the uh, actual data coming back from that spectrometer. And you can see. Uh, that, again, it's this modulated spectrum. You can also see that there's higher frequency here versus here. And so it's that frequency that encodes uh, the depth. Uh, so when we ultimately uh, inverse uh, transform that, we can um, you know, have that depth resolved. Now, a lot of the OCT systems are modular. And, and so while that's the core, a lot of the engineering goes into how we deliver the tissue. So we can send light through a microscope, we can send it down fibers uh, through a, a needle probe or a handheld probe and, and depending on the application that we want to use. So these are some examples uh, for these, ca these catheters. Uh, this is the sample arm, a single mode fiber. Um, and this actually came from my graduate studies. I was building this by hand. Uh, but we would put out a small lens <coughs> and, and a, a micro prism and then at the proximal end, we'd have a free space optical coupling because this catheter has to spin. Um, and it's shown here. And then when we insert it down an endoscope into the esophagus, it's going to spin uh, while the rest of the OCT system has to stay stationary. And so this collects radio images. Uh, we can also you know, send these single fibers into needles. So small needles that we can send the light forward or we can reflect it out the side and these needles can kind of rotate around. We can, just from the, the A scan, a single depth scan, we can differentiate tissue types. And, uh, and oftentimes there's ideas of using these needles to insert into tissue and determine <coughs> is that a tumor or what type of tissue might be uh, inside. These are just other examples where uh, real small needles that uh, have focusing optics, and again, you can uh, send the light out the, the front or out the side. Uh, this was kind of an interesting design where uh, the needle had a groove, and so as you, um, and, and light would come in and get reflected here and go across that channel and, and get reflected. And so since that was a known separation, if you put tissue in there, you could actually measure the refractive index of the tissue because um, the, the, this reflector, that path length would change depending on what tissue is there. So it's a way of also measuring refractive index. Um, and then we can spin those needles and we can collect you know, radio data like this. Uh, another needle design, a little bit more sophisticated, was um, to use a system that's used for clinical breast biopsy uh, uh, sampling. And the way they do this is if there's a, let's say a, a mass that's found on mammography and they have to go in and sample a piece of the tissue, they'll insert a needle, uh, they'll use ultrasound to kind of guide where that needle is going and then they'll, they'll sample, they'll take out a small little core of the tissue, bring it out, and then do histology on that. So the way these needles work is that uh, they're called vacuum assisted. They have this long needle, they have a biopsy channel, and uh, this channel opens up where the tissue will fall in, and then it closes to cut or cure it off. And then the vacuum sucks the tissue back into a tissue trap. Uh, and what we modified was we, we took uh, one of our OCT catheters and we inserted the catheter all the way up uh, to the tip. And we had a front window. And we had a, a transparent window here in that channel. So now as we inserted this into tissue, you could use OCT to guide where you're positioning it. And then when you think you're at the right spot, you can open up your channel, you can, the tissue falls in, you can image that, make sure you got the right tissue, and then you, you, you capture it and, and suck it out. And, uh, and so this was done, here's just a blow up of that front window and the tissue biopsy channel. Um, and this was done 
to guide um, looking at tumor and normal tissue uh, as we insert this, this needle in. So this is uh, real-time video, but you would be able to then assess where that needle tip is going. And this is important because as we've gotten better at diagnostics, the lesions, the abnormal areas are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, and to be able to sample those is getting harder and harder. And, and oftentimes ultrasound and other imaging from the outside isn't high enough resolution to figure out uh, are you sampling the right area. Well, a lot of companies uh, have, have been developed even more since I put the slide together. Uh, but these are what some of these systems look like. This is a traditional uh, ophthalmic system where the, the patient sits here, puts, looks into, this, into here. Uh, there was companies that looked at developing skin imaging. This is the uh, company for intravascular imaging. They use a catheter that's inserted and then there's even research-based uh, units that are sold. Uh, so uh, a lot of commercialization do some more. A lot of them are cart-based and so you can kind of see the, the format of what these look like. Okay. So just to recap, OCT is using near-infrared wavelengths. Our resolution is on the order of 10 microns. We image a few millimeters deep. We can integrate that. And uh, we have a lot of other uh, adjunct ways of, of looking at this data. And I'll talk about a few of those, uh, such as spectroscopic OCT. So what do we really need for using that OCT? Uh, well, let me stop and see if there's any questions that people have attended with on the class. So, yeah. so even for the current retinal scan, you need mirrors to scan across the back of the retina to tell the job. Correct, yeah. There are, people have looked at a line field, line scanning, so instead of a point that you scan a point across, you create a line and you scan a line across. And then instead of a spectrometer, you have a 2D texture array. So it's, it's, you're kind of taking parallel acquisition. Uh, and some people have done full field, so you, you basically have a, a, a full field beam across the tissue and you interfere that full field with full field in the reference arm. Um, there's some disadvantages to that because you get crossed off. Uh, so for instance, um, I talked about this multiple scattering. And if you have multiple scattering, if light comes in one point, comes out another, that, that's still gonna be detected somewhere else and you, you, you can get some interference or lower less signal to noise uh, with those approaches. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that in order to increase the resolution, you need a broadband source. And uh, I'm going to pick people, so uh, is the source you're using completely or not completely? So, I, I think you said, so you still want coherent, you want incoherent light. Mm -hmm, because um, you want the coherent lens to be short. Correct. But uh, you mentioned the supercontinuous and some other like broadband sources, and many of them are like coherent sources. So you are not using the coherent, but supercontinuous Yes. Yeah. So um, a lot of those broad superband, super continuum sources, uh, again, are, are going to be coherent over certain limited ranges, mm -hmm. but not necessarily widely coherent over. Uh, and when I use the term coherent, I mean, uh, say the wavelengths at, at 800. You know, is there that phase relationship at 13? In general, for, um, for for this, we want low coherence, and and there's that relationship between the time and, and space. So those those super continuum sources, you know, they can be compressed. So think it's good to think of the pulse analogy there. So a very broad super continuum can be compressed to a very very short pulse, like six femtoseconds, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's where that coherence comes from. But, uh, but I think the other important point is the, to note that you want a low coherence source uh, to give you a better axial resolution. Uh, to get higher transverse resolution, you focus tighter. Uh, and again, those are independent. Okay, so thinking about some examples, morphology, looking at morphology or structure, looking at cells, looking at molecules. And there are different issues that we have to, to deal with for each of these. Uh, and we can walk through some of this. These, these are some of the early images of OCT of the retina. And this, in fact, I think was one of the very first. Um, and you can, you can make out some different layers of the retina. Um, with advances in the spectral domain, we could start to resolve 
more of these retinal layers here. This is the retina on the back of the eye, the living human eye. Uh, but now systems have really gotten um, fast and higher resolution. We can make out many, many different layers, and we can collect volumes of data over time and, and really look at the, the different pathologies in the retina. Um, if we're looking at structure, these are examples of the human GI tract. So this is the esophagus wall compared to histology. This is the, the colon. And you can see that, uh, amazingly, the OCT images mm -hmm. resemble the morphology quite well uh, of the actual tissue. And it's also very interesting because these images are captured in very different ways. If you think about it, histology, you take out the tissue, you section it, you stain it, you put it flat on a microscope, and the image and the light is in transmission in this direction, right? OCT, you know, we have fresh tissue, and we're collecting light is incident from above and being reflected back. So they're completely orthogonal directions. Um, that we're collecting this light from, and yet the structure looks remarkably similar too. So that was, a, I think, always a big surprise for us that we could see such good structure um, with OCT. Uh, using those catheters, we wanted to look at um, changes that happen in the esophagus. So there's a condition, if anyone has heartburn, uh, chronic heartburn means that acid is coming from your stomach into your esophagus, and it changes the cells in the esophagus. And those can change into a cancer, a metaplastic, dysplastic, and then uh, neoplastic cancer. And so we needed ways of being able to go in and look at finding these structures, these, this glandular type structure that sometimes is below the surface. And uh, so OCT has been used for looking at that. Um, these are some of the early images in the coronary arteries. So uh, oftentimes there are devices that use intravascular ultrasound. And what you're looking at is, uh, this is, um, I think it's in vivo. Uh, this is an ultrasound catheter uh, being snaked inside a, a coronary artery, and it's spinning, so it collects a radio image. And you see a lot of speckle effects from ultrasound. With OCT, we get uh, roughly a factor of 100 times better resolution. And so we can see different layers within the coronary arteries. And this tells us more about whether or not someone has hardening of the arteries or uh, problems with uh, plaques there. Uh, skin examples, uh, these aren't the best images, but we can see things like sweat ducts. Uh, these are little spiral sweat ducts that come up to your fingerprint. And uh, we can image those. If we use um, OCM now, we can see really individual cells deep into the, the human skin and, and deep down into kind of the dermis. Uh, and this is compared to multi-photon nonlinear imaging. But, uh, but again, uh, this is label-free, you know, just looking at scattering properties of these cells. In tumors, uh, we can see structural differences. When tumors form, they change the organization of the tissue. And we can look at those differences. And um, this is really early work. But, uh, but because OCT is sensitive to scattering changes, whenever there's a, a property change of that tissue, we can detect it. So in one of the applications is when you're trying to kill, say, a tumor, you can uh, heat it up with a laser beam, or you can freeze it with a cryoprobe. Um, but it's often important to know, you know how much dose are you delivering. And so this was, I think, uh, this is liver tissue, which is pretty homogeneous, so you don't see a lot of features. But as we shine this laser from above and heat it up, we start to see changes here at 0.1 seconds, and then 0.6, and then it's superheating the tissue, so we start to see steam, a bubble, uh, that's forming here. And when we saw that, we shut off the laser, and so it kind of went back down. And we saw on histology this, this zone of thermal injury. So we could kind of regulate that. Now, um, if we let it, this thing go, we, we can see that it starts to heat up, we start to see this, but there's actually this ejection of tissue that actually boiled the tissue off, it, it erupted, it, it ablated the tissue, you can see some fragments, and, and we have this very catastrophic type of injury. Uh, and so OCT could be used to guide that type of dosimetry or therapy. Um, this was a case where uh, in muscle tissue, there are small little vessels, blood vessels down here, that uh, you know, had blood in them, and by heating them up, we can coagulate the blood in those vessels, and 
This is very common for people that have port, port wine stains, which are vascular malformations on the skin. Often those are treated by going in and coagulating the blood vessels, and then they, they just regress. But you don't want to, again, don't want to damage the overlying skin. So the idea here is that we could watch to see that these vessels, these two little vessels here, start to get coagulated, uh, and then we stop. But if we, if we continue, we start to damage uh, the overlying tissue. And if we do the histology, we can show that we coagulated the blood that's present in the blood vessels. So that's another way of, of using morphology and structure. Uh, cellular imaging, uh, a lot of my uh, graduate work was to look at developing this, this tadpole model, uh, which is really interesting. These are little frog tadpoles about a few millimeters long. Uh, they're great samples to image because they develop all kinds of morphology and organs rapidly. And we can do uh, essentially a tadpole CT uh, and acquire this three-dimensional image uh, and see all these scattering structures and cells that, that develop in these. Um, so we can take uh, and see individual cells in these animals. We can take 3D volumes uh, of those cells. Uh, we can look at the beating heart in that tadpole. Um, and in some cases, we can even watch the cells that are dividing. So it's interesting to see how cells are dividing. And these black cells are called melanocytes. They have melanin pigment in them. They're also stem cells that migrate in the tissue. Um, and to go off to form different structures in the, in the embryo or the tadpole. So this is just a sequence where we found a cell that was dividing, and every 10 minutes we took an image and we saw those, those, those daughter cells divide. Um, those stem cells originate from the, the neural crest here, and they'll migrate uh, throughout. And so um, I think I have, yeah. So we are able to track one of these melanocytes as it's migrating in three-dimensional space. Uh, through the embryo. In fact, we can we can see its its, its dynamic behavior and, and and really watch these types of events uh, longitudinally without any contrast agents, without sacrificing these these animals. So a lot we could do at the cellular level. Um, some of the more recent work uh, in my lab here has been to look at multimodal approaches. So combining OCT with multi-photon microscopy and slim and really building microscopes that take advantage of all the different contrasts that you can generate from these different optical techniques. So in one case, we looked at uh, wound healing. So this is a small little pinprick in the skin of a mouse. And uh, this mouse had uh, all its bone marrow cells labeled with uh, green fluorescent protein. So the green here that you see are these cells coming from the bone marrow to heal the wound. It's a little bit harder to see, but there's this gray area that's from the OCT or OCM. Uh, and then the red is from the second harmonic generation, the collagen that's present. And so these, these little dark areas are the spots where the, cap the follicles, the air follicles are located. You can see there's little capillaries circulating around each one of those. And using this multimodal approach, we can get a better idea of these, these cell processes. Um, a PhD student in my group developed an algorithm that basically that took this multimodal data and then co-registered it over time. And so this, I think, only goes out to 35 days, but we've been able to look at many, many months and be able to look at signals such as the OCT, or the OCM. Uh, we can look at the vasculature by using, uh, by monitoring the, the dynamics of the OCT signal. And then this is an overlay that shows the, you know, the hair and those green cells coming in that to repair the wound. So everything, if you look at each one of these is a different day, same mouse, um, but if you look at the follicles, they don't change. So you know, this is the effect of that algorithm to co-register the data. And once you co-register the, the, the large scale changes, then you can start to look in and measure the dynamics of single cells and how they're moving within that tissue. Okay. Um, you go to 1220, is that right? You take a break or? Uh, so another way to think about the OCT signal, there's really a lot of information in this signal. And, and one way to take advantage of that is in a technique called spectroscopic OCT. And this comes back to, again, that, that relationship between the, the spectrum and that autocorrelation function, the Wiener-Kitchen theorem. Okay, 
so if we have a single depth scan that looks like this from our time domain system, uh, then we can look at the envelope of this, and that envelope gave us the structural information for a structural OCT image. That tells us the amplitude, or the, the scatter. But if we look at the fringe data here, the interference data, that can tell us something about the spectroscopic content. Okay. So here's an example. Like let's let's take an interference filter okay, that uh, has a center wavelength at 740 and a bandwidth of 10 nanometers. So that's what it's going to absorb. If this is our spectrum from our OCT system, from a tie sapphire laser, that's sent onto this filter then we're going to get a reflection back from the surface. And then there's going to be light that goes through the filter and gets reflected back from the back surface. Okay, so if we look at the front surface, this is that autocorrelation function. And we take the Fourier transform of this to recover the, our spectrum, all right? Because it's simply been a reflection. So that spectral content has been unchanged. So that looks like that. But if we look at the reflection coming from this back surface, we can see that that autocorrelation function has been Change. And if we take the Fourier transform of that, we get a spectrum that looks like this. And the spectrum has been changed. If you look at the 740 10 nanometer bandwidth, we've essentially knocked out the, the wavelengths that were absorbed by that filter. So we can look at the, the returning reflections of light, and we, we can do Fourier analysis and reconstruct what's been absorbed or what wavelengths have been scattered by the tissue. And we can do this in a depth resolved way. Okay. So that's, that's the power of spectroscopic OCT. Um, we can do the same thing regardless of what system we're using. So here, uh, if we have a time domain system, we can look at windows. So we can look at a window here and, and Fourier transform that and look at the spectrum. Or we can look at a window here and do the same. So we, we can get depth resolved spectrum coming back. And we can do the same thing with the spectral data. So there's different ways of representing this, this information. Uh, one way is to kind of look at the spec, the centroid of that spectrum and how well it, and has it shifted. So we know what the baseline spectrum is and we can tell, has it shifted to longer or shorter wavelengths? Um, you know, where is the absorption occurring? And this is one way to show this. So if we look at those tadpoles again, and we look at those melanocytes that strongly absorb uh, you know, certain wavelengths, then here they just show up as, you know, uh, scattering objects and relatively similar to, say, like this membrane up here or those nuclei. But if spectroscopically, they behave very differently. So they have very strong, they change the spectral content because they're strongly absorbing. And that's different from the nuclei that are seen here. Uh, similarly, if we look at the, the Barrett's esophagus again, um, and in the amplitude-only image, it's rather difficult to compare uh, if there's differences here. But if we look spectroscopically, we see that this is the stratified epithelium, the normal tissue, compared to Barrett's. The normal tissue uh, has strong absorbers. So in other words, the centroid shifts um, to the longer wavelengths. So that means the shorter wavelengths are getting absorbed um, by this normal tissue, which may be blood, for instance. Doing that. But it's very different in the Barrett. So it's another way of differentiating the tissue types based on the absorbers that might be present. Okay, that's one technique. Well, to do this multimodal approach, uh, we build these, these different microscopes. This um, is fairly complicated, but uh, allows us to do multi-photon microscopy, nonlinear microscopy with OCM and combine these. So these are some examples where that multi-photon, we've labeled cell nuclei. These are green fluorescent proteins and fibroblasts. Uh, but if you look at OCM, uh, we see these interesting profiles. And, and what you're seeing, what do you think these bands are? Where have you seen those other places in optics? Hologram. Hologram? Yeah. So what do you think that they're from? What generates it? Uh, interference. So interference from coherent signals. Uh, in a sense, and we don't really know, but this is our best guess. You know, these are cells that are sitting on a dish. And what you're seeing is interference from, say, reflections from the top of the cell 
and the, the glass bottom, the microscope slot that they're sitting on. And, and if you kind of blur your eyes a little bit, um, this looks like a topography map. So you can actually map the topography of these cells just by simply looking at, because that's, that, those fringes come at every half wavelength. And so you can actually measure the height of the cells and structures by, by looking at those fringes. Uh, so that's kind of a side benefit that comes from that. In general, though, the scattering signal that we get back uh, also tells us information about particle size, uh, about the tissue type. It can be used for tumor detection because we, we know traditionally when tumors form, the size of the nucleus changes, and we can look at the size of, of that. There's a whole another field called light scattering spectroscopy um, that you may or may not talk about in, in class, but it essentially collects this cube of data hyperspectral data, uh, and one axis of that is, is acquired from spectral, spectroscopic OCT, where we can look at the intensity of the light scattered versus wavelength. Okay. Um, we did a lot of work in my group a while ago about trying to characterize these wavelength-dependent scattering changes. And we modeled uh, our beam, and we modeled, say, a large scatter, a nucleus, little mitochondria. And depending on where those objects were in the beam, we saw very different scattering profiles, wavelength-dependent scattering profiles. So what it tells us is that by looking at the scattered light coming back, we can begin to size the particles that are present. And then we experimentally showed this. If we took four micron beads and we collected scattering signals from those beads and we compared it to me scattering theory, it looked quite good. And then six micron changes that wavelength dependent scattering and it matches quite well to, to theory. So we can potentially now measure the size of those scatterers in a depth resolved way. And, and that's, that's unique. We tried to do this with cells. Cells are a lot more uh, uh, heterogeneous than, than beads. And uh, we compared a mic macrophage to a fibroblast. So macrophages are big, fat, brown. Oftentimes fibroblasts are skinny and, and fibrous like. Um, and then we looked at the scattering properties from those. And we compared different methods. We can look at the autocorrelation of that scattering signal. We can take the Fourier transform, and we can see differences uh, between these different cell types. So um, let me get to that right here. So these are gels filled with these different types of cells, and they just look like blobs to us. But if we do the spectral analysis, we can see that spectroscopically they look very different. Um, and so this really depends again on the organelles, the nucleus uh, that's present in these cells. But these are all things that suggested we can measure the particle size, uh, wavelength dependent scattering, in addition to say absorption changes. Like this. Um, I think I'll skip over some of this. These are just showing examples how if we have this, this uh, tissue and just the OCT signal looks like this, and we can apply this, these different spectroscopic methods to highlight areas of these tissues that have different size scatterers. So certain, you know, there's a collection here, um, these aren't perfectly registered, but these are different cell types than what's here in the middle, which is mostly like fat here, compared to more dense cells out here. So we can characterize, again, the scattering properties of this. And if we even go back to these fibroblasts in our culture, um, we can see then that these are nuclei that are stained. This is the OCM data. And if we do spectroscopic analysis, we see that there's spectroscopic scattering changes wherever there's nuclei. So wherever there's a certain scattering profile from those nuclei, we can find those. And you can see that that matches very well with uh, when we overlay the fluorescent signal from the nucleus with the scattering signal. From OCM. So again, a way of identifying scatterers based on that. Um, the last part I wanted to talk about is just an example. So cancer is one area that we've really applied uh, this technology to. Uh, it's a molecular disease. Uh, everybody knows its impact. But we really need ways of being able to assess the molecular and cellular changes of cancer. And, and morphologically, there's changes. We have you know, normal tissue with dysplasia, uh, the cell nuclei and the nucleus, the cytoplasmic ratio changes. 
So that's one way where we can look at the scattering changes of those cells. Um, carcinoma in situ means that there's uh, heterogeneity there, and then malignant cancer is when they migrate out through the spacement membrane and metastasize. And those can metastasize into the bloodstream and lymphatics and form metastatic cancer. So it's important for us to look at the morphology, to look at scattering changes. Even right now, our interest is what are the molecular changes that are happening early on? So much of this work has been applied to breast cancer. And if we traditionally in medicine, uh, all of these diagnoses are made looking at tissue under a microscope. And so there's an adage, you can't make a diagnosis unless you have tissue. You have to take tissue out, stain it. And the idea is, could we actually change you know, when and where we make that diagnosis? Could we, can we do this type of OCT in the operating room or at the point of care? And that's very important. So early on, we compared OCT with histology. This is invasive ductal, ductal carcinoma. And we get very good correlation. We don't have the staining that is often used as cues for histology, but we get this image in a, in a fraction of a second, and this takes days. Uh, and so that's a huge advantage. Uh, also, we looked at lymph nodes because lymph nodes uh, are assessed to see if a tumor has spread. And if uh, these lymph nodes act as filters for any tumor cell. And if we look at the scattering properties of a normal lymph node, it's fairly low. If we just see scattering at the surface. These are 3D volumes. But when there's metastatic disease, those tumor cells get in there and they change the scattering properties. And so our image looks very different. Uh, in a, a metastatic lymph node. So here at Carl, we actually set up a protocol where we could bring our system into the operating room and do uh, ex vivo imaging here. We also use various needles that we would insert into the, the specimens. We would mark these specimens. Uh, we would then send them off to pathology and we would compare our results interoperatively with what's done in post-op. And we see examples like this. So. Uh, in breast cancer, the problem is one in three patients undergoing surgery are going to get called back for repeat surgeries because they leave tumor cells behind. And they don't know about that until the pathologist looks at the tissue days later. So instead, if we can look at this intraoperatively, we can save that second surgery, save the cost, save the anxiety, uh, perhaps treat the disease better. So we see images like this of a normal margin so this is OCT scanned across the normal margin of that mass taken out. And then this is the histology, again, days later. So very good correspondence. We also see things that uh, happen when we see these more scattering areas. That's the dense tumor that's left behind at that margin. And this is in a, a small little foci of tumor cells at this margin. These are less than a millimeter in size. Uh, the, the surgeon would never find that. Uh, but we can pick these up um, you know, as, as they're scanned tissue. So we get 3D volumes of these margins, of these lymph nodes. Uh, and this was an older study, but uh, one of our first, where we were looking at ex vivo samples in the OR and getting a very good sensitivity and specificity of finding cancer in the operating room compared to uh, the pathology lab. Uh, I don't have a slide here, but we also just last year finished a, a study where we were using our handheld probe like this. The surgeon was taking the probe and now scanning in the patient. So the surgeon would remove that mass, uh, the surgeon would take our probe and scan the, the, the tumor cavity looking for any left, leftover tumor cells. And, and this is a technology that's been commercialized to a company. Um, and so it's not quite uh, FDA approved yet uh, for use. But, uh, but eventually, the surgeon's gonna be able to use that data to then make interventions. And if he or she sees any residual tumor cells to be able to remove those during the procedure. So that, that's, I think, going to make a huge impact on, on people's lives. Um, a couple other things we can do uh, with this, this technology. Uh, working with Professor Scott Carney here, uh, we developed a technique called uh, ISAM, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Microscopy. Um, actually, I think this, we didn't model it after iPhone. Um, and it's computationally allows us to reconstruct the, the image data. So with OCT, you know, we talked about a beam focus and, and everything at the focus is sharp and has that high resolution, right, transverse resolution. 
above and below the focus, that beam spreads out and our transverse resolution gets worse. Okay. However, in an OCT system, we're collecting all this information about the reflection coming back. And we can use algorithms that computationally correct for defocus. So we can correct, and every point in that volume can be brought into focus computationally. So that's what ISAM does, is computationally corrects for the, the blurring from the beam. Uh, we can also correct aberrations, because if, if we're essentially tracking the wavefronts of these beams, we can, as light goes through tissue, it becomes aberrated, right? That beam profile gets uh, uh, changed. And we can go in then and computationally correct for it. So, so this is a tissue phantom uh, that is, has blurry, you know, blurry above and below this focus, and with uh, this aberration correction, we can go in and, and correct all these. So we can um, computationally go in and adjust these Zernike polynomials, and we can uh, bring this into focus. We can also shift focal planes. So um, we can really collect a 3D volume and then computationally change the focus and correct for all the aberrations that might be present. All right, last, uh, last application. Uh, I, I was talking about the operating room, uh, but there's also, you know, if you think about much of the technology developed uh, for the work we do is applied to or directed to the specialist, right? Now the specialist in healthcare is the doctor who you go to see when you've been diagnosed with something. So you go to your doctor, they say you've got, you know, some problem with your eye, right? first doctor you see just says you've got a problem. The second doctor you see is telling you what kind of problem you have. So that's the specialist. And they, have, they, get, they tend to get all the fancy toys, right, and expensive instruments to figure out, to diagnose exactly what you have. However, there's still a lot of need out there at the move technology to that first doctor you see. Because that first doctor is trying to say if something's wrong or normal, right, that's their job. Uh, and if we look at the primary care, the emergency room, there are optical instruments there already to look in your eyes and ears, your skin, um, trying to see if there's any of those diseases present. So a lot of our effort was to, to think about, well, if we're trying to detect disease earlier, uh, shouldn't we be detecting disease here and not here? Because here, you're already diagnosed, they know something's wrong, it's, it's maybe too late, you see. Uh, so we went about developing portable systems with changing the, the handheld scanners. Instead of the otoscope to look in your ear, the ophthalmoscope, uh, we added OCT capabilities. And with that, we're able to get, you know, in the doctor's office, uh, this happens to be an image of you, a cuticle. So if you look at your nail, it's the zone between your fingernail and the skin, um, and that's, that's this area here. Here's the nail plate. Uh, this is the oral epithelium, so looking for oral cancer in your mouth. This is the skin. Um, this is your cornea, so the front surface of your eye, the back surface, the retina. This is your eardrum, because when kids get ear infections, they get bacteria inside your ear. And this is also a, the optic uh, nerve head in the back of your eye. So these are all captured with this portable system uh, on you know, uh, living patients, AKA grad students, volunteer grad students, uh, and uh, you know, captured in real time to look at these tissues. So this is an area that I think is going to uh, also continue to be explored for moving that technology to the front line uh, in these portable low-cost systems. So just to wrap up, you know, OCT is, is we think is very versatile and has a lot of different applications. Uh, it's good at looking at structure, uh, cells, even this molecular imaging, and, uh, and I've given examples of this uh, image-guided surgery, uh, margin assessment, and, and more, I think, um, so I've got a big group of, of people. Um, Kelly is the name there too, so she's in the class. And, and Lynn, uh, but a great group of people and collaborators uh, that have to come together because this really takes an interdisciplinary group uh, of people to come together for uh, doing this type of uh, research. And, um, and also I think it's, it's important to know that last year was our, our International Year of Light, uh, and which was really a recognition that light, the impact that light has on our lives and both for the diagnostics and imaging like this, but also you know, allowing you to work on your computer, see your computer screen and, and, uh, and work late at night studying. You know, um, happy to uh, 
answer any questions you have too about this technology or about commercialization of this or uh, really any aspect in mind. <clears throat> you might stand up the slides later. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot here. There's a lot of slides, but I'll, I'll send out a PDF uh, to Professor Popeski and can post those on the website. Yeah. Have we looked at how the tissue looks like after it's been removed and cauterized, and that compared to how removed to Yeah, yeah, we have. So, so during surgery, there's, there's changes that happen to the tissue. So, uh, obviously, they will uh, use a scalpel or they'll cut off tissue. Uh, they'll use um, it's called kind of an electro cautery device. So sometimes if there's bleeding, uh, they'll cauterize the vessels that were cut to kind of limit bleeding. Um, they don't always do that on the sample that comes out, but oftentimes they'll do that in the tissue. And when tissue is cauterized, I showed some examples of how the tissue changes when it's cauter you know, heated up by a laser in that case. Um, it becomes dense, it becomes more highly scattering. But it often is just at the surface. So that's usually how we distinguish. Like, um, if there's this cautery, very irregular surface feature that's not so much in depth, um, and oftentimes a surgeon can see visually that it's a cauterized area. So even though we're looking at images here, there's a lot more additional knowledge the surgeon has by looking at the tissue. Uh, but yeah, cautery is one area. If there's blood, blood is highly absorbing and, and scattering, so it shows up as a very thin coating on the top of the tissue, but we can always wash that off. Um, so looking at these types of artifacts are really important and trying to make an assessment of whether that's tumor or not. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm here, I'm always here. If people have questions, uh, feel free to send me an email. Or